Now, we use the latest science to explore what the elephant man really suffered from. To ask whether his descendants are at risk from his disease breaking out again today. And we reveal for the first time what he may have looked like with his disfigurement stripped away. Joseph Merrick was born in Leicester in 1862. His deformities began developing when he was five. By his late teens, he was shockingly disfigured. The measurement around my head is 36 inches. My face is such a sight that no one could describe it. My feet and legs are covered with thick, lumpy skin, like that of an elephant and almost the same color. Joseph believed his problems began when his pregnant mother was frightened by an elephant. My mother was going along the street when a procession of animals were passing by. Unfortunately, she was pushed under the elephant's feet. With no convincing medical diagnosis, this naive explanation seemed the only answer. His condition made him an outcast. After his mother's death, his father and stepmother rejected him. He was taken in by his uncle Charles, a men's hairdresser. Today, Charles's great-grandson Ray Merrick is a barber too. The family is proud of its long history in the hairdressing trade, but Joseph was a source of fear and shame. Later generations of Merricks pruned all traces of him from the family tree. We obviously asked questions of my mother, and uh, eventually she, uh, <laughs> she admitted that uh, she knew all about it, but she never told us. My uh, daughter-in-law, she phoned me up one day. She said, I'm going to um, start researching our uh, family tree. And I said, well, you want to be careful. You might find some bones in the cupboard. As she searched for missing fragments of the family history, Ray's daughter-in-law, Michelle, uncovered the family secret. Their unease grew. When we found out there was a connection to Joseph Merrick, um, I suppose the feelings were mixed in that, as a genealogist, it was an exciting bit of news. Um, but then there was also the feeling that I had young children and suddenly there was this illness that was known to be in the family. For Michelle's husband, John Merrick, the discovery was a childhood nightmare come true. At school he'd been taunted just for having the same name as the elephant man. They just thought Joseph Merrick was a freak and of course if you're not normal or if you're connected to something not being normal that's always a problem, particularly when you're growing up. Most of it was light-hearted, and, and because I thought there was no connection at that time, it didn't really bother me that much. Now they know for certain they are related to the Elephant Man, the Merricks face a new concern. Is Joseph's disease still lurking in one of the branches of the family tree? Could another member of his family suffer the same terrible fate in the future? Scientists may be able to answer those questions. They will need to obtain DNA from Joseph's remains and from both sides of his family, the Merricks on his father's side and the Pottertons on his mother's. Joseph never fathered any children, so he has no direct descendants. His brothers and sisters also had no children, but that doesn't mean it's a dead end. The same DNA runs in the descendants of Joseph's uncles and aunts. In Leicester, members of the local genealogy society are slowly sifting through the generations of Merricks and Pottertons. I look for his death and find out um, from his death certificate um, exactly what he died of and when he died. Mm. It's funny how quite a few of the Potterton girls didn't marry. It makes you wonder why. Mm. Did they know? of any connection in 
because of that, decided not to marry and have children. Who knows? This is an enormous challenge. Descendants of the Pottertons who did marry could now be living anywhere under any name. The genealogists make a radio appeal for people who think they might be related to the elephant man's mother, Mary Jane Potterton. By a strange coincidence, the local radio station stands on the very spot in Leicester where Joseph Merrick once lived. The public appeal pays off. Within a few weeks, the genealogists identify several Potterton descendants. Now, from his father's side of the family, a Merrick is going to meet those long-lost relatives. They're holding their first family reunion in four generations on the south coast in Bournemouth. Over a century after Joseph's death, they'll confront the past and their new fears. On a freezing winter's day, the two families meet in a hotel bar. The Pottertons and their partners are anxious to compare notes with the Merricks. Perhaps they can piece together some of the clues to the puzzle of the elephant man's condition. John Merrick seems to have escaped the curse of the elephant man. Soon he'll know if the Pottertons have been as lucky. Hello. 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 Uh, I'm John Merrick. I'm Clive Selby. Oh, hi. A pleasure. Bill Potterton. Hello, Bill. Jimmy my daughter, Jimmy. Hello. Oh. Oh. Well, I've um, brought my family tree along. Oh, Great. Yeah, we've been uh, comparing, <coughs> talking about our family tree. The only thing I know about you is Mary Jane Potterton, married, 29th of December, 1861. To Joseph Rockley, married. You descend from there, do you? No, I descend this way around. Joseph Rockley's brother is Charles Barnabas. Uh -huh. Until recently, none of these people knew for certain they were related to the Elephant Man. It was a family secret left untold. My grandparents always firmly denied it. Whenever it came up, they said, no, absolutely not. There's no connection at all. <laughs> well, my aunt here, Auntie Doll, she always denied very strongly that there was any connection at all. Mm. She didn't know, but mm -hmm. she was convinced in her own mind that there was well, no yeah, connection. Yeah. They wouldn't want to admit it. No. Yeah. Because um, yeah. if you look at the dates, um, they were, my, both my grandparents were born in 1895. That's only five years after Joseph died. died yeah. So yes. the parents, the grandparents, certainly would have known. I mean, Charles Henry would have known Joseph. He lived in the same house as at yes. one time. Now the link has been made, there are serious implications for the family. Michelle discovered the, uh, that Marion was actually born a cripple. And uh, we don't know what disease it was, but she died early as well. Yeah, and, and likewise in my grandfather's, our grandfather's generation, um, you look at the youngest brother, Thomas H. Potterton, we know he died young and was paralysed from birth. Like my father's generation, a surprising number have had cancer. Edie died of cancer. Hilda died of cancer. Uncle Jim, he had cancer. He didn't die of it, but he had it. Uncle Bill died of cancer. My father died of cancer. My brother died of cancer. And now I've got it. He'll close the study door, phone first direct, and the next minute he'll be roaring with laughter. He will be flirting on the phone with them, having a great time. We'll come out and say, I've done the banking, and I'm supposed to be impressed by the banking that he's done. But it's relaxing. It's efficient, and it's accurate. It must be there's a really nice person at the other end every time. There's one girl in Glasgow. <laughs> oh, yes, she's tell me about that. I've quite worked out a shift pattern. <laughs> she's not as nice as me, is she? No, dear. <laughs> 
And so our research into the perfect driving sensation leads us here. The derriere. The closer to the road, the better. The Renault McGann. The cold can dry your face, making it feel more sensitive. Neutrogena Facial Moisturizer. Its Norwegian formula relieves, moisturizes and protects all day long. Norwegian Formula Facial Moisturizer from Neutrogena. It works. I must get the seven dwarf tea ready. Now they like chocolate, baked beans, and ketchup. <laughs> it's a fairy cake! <laughs> hey, come on, madam. Let's clean you up before the dwarves get home. New person with fizz now cleans better than before on every stain imaginable. Without this woman, my father couldn't have had his hip replaced. Without these people, I'd be dead. This man helped my son through leukemia. Do something amazing. Give blood. Norwich Union Direct, I've got a three-bedroomed house and I'd like you to quote me happy, like that nice young man on the telly. That's right, quote me happy, shower me with happiness. That little, that's amazing. Hey, this quote me happy stuff really works, doesn't it? Let Norwich Union Direct put a smile on your face. Call 0800 888 and let us quote you happy. Welcome to God's country. The Texas season continues with the Texas Solution. Friday at 7.30 on 4. Does the present-day family of the Elephant Man bear the illness that affected him? The only way to answer that means scientists will need some of the Elephant Man's DNA. They are about to attempt a remarkable first, to extract DNA from Joseph Merrick's bones. That could be the key to the enigma of the Elephant Man. When Joseph Merrick's immediate family turned their backs on him, he was taken in by his uncle Charles, a hairdresser. Now Joseph's own hair could play a role in revealing the secret of his terrible disease. When Joseph died in 1890, the London hospital made a cast of his head. Dozens of tiny hairs are still trapped in the plaster. Some of them may contain traces of his DNA. But even if traces do remain, isolating that DNA is close to impossible. One scientist at the University of Oslo in Norway accepts the challenge. Professor Erika Hegelberg is a geneticist and a leading expert in aged DNA. She was among the team to identify the remains of Tsar Nicholas and his family, executed after the Russian Revolution. She extracted the royal DNA from bones exhumed from a mass grave over 70 years later. Bizarrely, in the case of Joseph Merrick, the problem for Professor Hegelberg may be too much DNA. The worst case scenario is that we'll get a lot of different DNA sequences, because in the last hundred years there's been hundreds of people 
people have been um, handling this, this cast. I think that can be a bit of a problem. She'll use newly developed methods to extract whatever DNA remains. Then, molecule by molecule, other scientists will search for clues to Joseph Merrick's condition. His disfigurement condemned him to a miserable existence, unable to be tolerated in public without a mask. My deformity had grown to such an extent that I could not move about the town without having a crowd of people gathered round me. So, thought I, I'll get my living by being exhibited about the country. could become rich and famous. What Joseph wanted was enough money to buy some solitude. At Sheffield University, one department specializes in the study of fairs and the public's appetite for freak shows. People always wanted to see a curiosity of freak. 16th to the 18th century, these were very much kind of monsters. In the 19th century, it was more of a show business. It was part of the show business tradition. It was on the musicals, the variety theatres. You knew the story the showman was telling you or the, the novelty he was telling you was completely untrue. But it was part of the tradition. And the showman's tradition in the 19th century, as it is today, is to create an illusion out of nothing. I'm sure nobody believed that the elephant man was actually named after an elephant. Joseph signed up with Tom Norman, the self-styled Silver King of the travelling shows. Norman was a larger-than-life character. At any one time, he had more than a dozen shows on tour. Some of his most popular acts would be too shocking for audiences today. One of his most fantastic shows was The Rat-Eating Girl, and he gives us a description of how a woman used to go in the front of the stage, take the, a rat, bite the head of a live rat, chew it and spit it out and he describes how men and women would faint as the blood trickled down from her chin. Norman put Joseph on show in an empty shop in East London. A banner advertised the extraordinary new attraction. The shop still exists. Right across the street from the Royal London Hospital. Staff from the hospital flocked to see the freak. Their accounts reached the head surgeon, Frederick Treves. He arranged a private viewing of the elephant man, which made a strong impression on him. The most striking feature about him was the enormous and misshapen head. On the brow there projected a huge bony mass, like a loaf, while from the back of the head hung a bag of spongy, fungus-looking skin, the surface of which was comparable to brown cauliflower. This meeting was ultimately to lead to a lasting relationship between surgeon and sufferer. Treves was appalled at the way Norman seemed to be exploiting Joseph's condition to make money. He was taken about the country to be exhibited as a monstrosity and an object of loathing. He was shunned like a leper, housed like a wild beast, and got his only view of the world from a peephole in a showman's cart. That's not the only way to look at it, according to Dr. Toulmin. They were remarkably intelligent people. They weren't captive, they weren't treated as animals, they were treated as respectable artists in their own right. Frederick Trees, in some ways, created more of a monster than Tom Norman. Frederick Treves is more in the tradition of the great monster makers of the 18th century. And it's an interesting parallel that the medical profession and the fairground profession both have the same interest in these freak show novelties. Ultimately, they both want to make money and careers out of them. But in some ways, when you look at the accounts of 19th century freak shows 
and you read any kind of printed reminiscences, they're more terrified of going into the hands of the medical profession than they are on the show. Treve's first concern was to make a detailed study of Merrick. He persuaded Joseph to come to the hospital for a thorough examination. I arranged that Merrick should cross the road in a cab, and to ensure his immediate admission to the college, I gave him my card. This card was destined to play a critical part in Merrick's life. Treves presented his new case to the Pathological Society. Joseph was paraded naked before the leading physicians of the day. He was more on show than at the circus. But the learned doctors were baffled. Joseph's symptoms were outside their experience. Most of them couldn't even suggest a diagnosis, let alone a cure. They were unaware that a German scientist had recently identified a disease that might explain Joseph's symptoms. A genetic condition called neurofibromatosis, or NF1. Severe cases are rare, but devastating. Hundreds of small tumours grow on the nerves and sometimes form massive folds of overgrown tissue. This could be the first step towards a diagnosis. Is it a step in the right direction? Could NF1 really cause Joseph's deformities? And could it someday create another elephant man? In Columbus, Ohio, one family has been afflicted by neurofibromatosis for generations. The tumors inside Richard Owensby's body are growing out of control. Now the pressure on his spinal cord is beginning to cripple him. It's incurable. Even today, a century after Joseph Merrick's death, all the hospital can do is offer advice and sympathy. You've been experiencing, I guess, more problems with your yeah. condition. Yeah. Walking is becoming a problem. They said they, it's one uh, pushing on a nerve in my back, but they don't know which one it is. Okay. So. And they've done tests to... CAT scans or yeah. MRIs, look at the back and... Yeah. But they, it, they showed me the MRI and it's like 20 of them in a the bunch, 20 or 30 of them in a the bunch. And they don't know which one it is, so... Go, basically running up your spine? Is that what yeah, they're... Yeah, at, at the base of my back, in a, in a group about the size of, I say about the size of a baseball. And are they planning on doing any surgeries or just... They don't know which one it is, so they don't want to mess with it. Okay. His older sister, Geraldine, um, we are, she had them, but she was functional, and then she called me one day, said she couldn't stand. And I went over, she was on the steps trying to call up, and then they took her to the hospital. They had found one. They removed it, but it didn't help. She stayed in a wheelchair for about 10 years until she died. Richard's family history is one of tragedy. Brothers, sisters, cousins all destroyed by neurofibromatosis. That's almost 10 years ago. Yeah, it is. It does pass by fast, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. That was almost 10 years. Same lost look. Is that what y'all call that look? Lost. It's of lostness. Richard's day is filled with pain. What hurts him most is the loss of his mobility. His own health problems give Richard a powerful perspective on Joseph Merrick's suffering. He had a rough. He had a real rough. The way people treated him and stuff wasn't right. Things could be about to get even rougher for Richard's family. The defective gene that causes NF1 may claim a new victim. 
His niece, Heather, is carrying a child. Uh, I'm Heather. Do you have children? No, but I'm pregnant now. Pregnant now? Right. Oh, how far along are you? Three months. Three months? Mm -hmm. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. As a, what we call also a dominant condition, men and women can have this and pass this down. So really there would be a 50-50 chance, a one in two chance, almost right. like a flip of a coin, that each child you have could have neurofibromatosis. In fact, NF1 is surprisingly common. We all have a 1 in 3,000 chance of being born with it. For most people, the only sign will be a few brown blemishes, called cafe spots. But in some people, its effects are devastating. Can NF1 alone be devastating enough to cause the elephant man's deformities? Joseph Merrick may retain vital clues in his skeleton. It lives at the Royal London Hospital. David Nunn is the latest curator to care for Joseph's remains. He can make out many telltale signs of NF1 in Joseph's bones. The skeleton has an enlargement on the right-hand side, the, the limbs, both the upper limb and uh, right lower limb are longer than their left counterparts. Joseph shows a high degree of curvature of the spine. It goes off to the right and then back to the left, up to the cervical region in the neck. In neurofibromatosis, the nerves tend to be rather enlarged, and to allow for the passage of these through the skull, we see enlarged holes here on the right-hand side, compared with the normal-sized hole over here on the left. So there's certainly evidence that Joseph Merrick was suffering from neurofibromatosis. But there has never been another case of the disease as severe. By the time he reached his early 20s, he had found a way to earn his keep, but only in the glare of public curiosity. Soon even that lifeline would fail him. He was to sink to his lowest ebb. His appearance became so horrific, the authorities kept moving him on. Finally, in 1885, he left England to seek his fortune in Europe. It ended in disaster. Destitute and despairing, he returned to England. The future looked bleak, and he had no plans to fall back on. His disease was progressing. On his arrival in London, everything came to a head. The deformities that had made his living now made him an object of fear and loathing. Joseph's condition did not allow him to outrun his pursuers. Yet his darkest hour was to become the moment of his salvation. Amongst his few possessions was the head surgeon of the London Hospital's calling card. Another high-performance car. 
from Jaguar. Do it all on your next holiday to British Columbia, Canada. British Columbia. Everything you're looking for in a holiday all in one place. Call for your free holiday guide. Canada. Discover our true nature. Cavalry of the Napoleonic Wars, cuirassiers, hussars, mamelukes, Cossacks, uhlans. A collection of die-cast figurines designed by exceptionally talented craftsmen to satisfy the most demanding collectors. The first issue comes with a figurine of a British Dragoon Guard and a booklet for only $2.99. Energy is the lifeblood of your business. Thirty percent of it is going to waste. Save energy. Save money. For a free starter pack, call Action Energy on 0800 917 30 30. Passport check and send further. Yes, dear, brilliant. Foreign currency with 0% commission. 20, 30, 40. Cheers, mate. Wow. What's your menu, sir? Just because I'm starving. Oh, my dear. Yeah. Travel insurance. Everything you need to visit your aunt in Australia. Crikey. My, haven't you grown? I am too. The post office. For the little things that make the big things happen. The English believe it's a slur on your host's food if you don't clear your plate. Mm. Whereas the Chinese feel you're questioning their generosity if you do. Okay. At HSBC, we never underestimate the importance of local knowledge. Okay. HSBC, the world's local bank. Visit British Columbia. Packages start at £998 per person. Call 0870-727-6918 for your free holiday guide, courtesy of Canada and Travel Pack. This new year, you can have it all. Divide your time between the calm of the country and the buzz of the city. Follow Kirsty and Phil as they turn the two-home dream into reality. I'm dead keen on this one. I found it. Less of that smart talk. <laughs> relocation, relocation, Wednesday at 8 on 4. In 1886, a calling card was to save Joseph Merrick from a tragic fate. He was rescued from the crowd by the police. He had, however, something with him which he produced with a ray of hope. It was my card. It was the card the head surgeon of the London Hospital, Frederick Treves, had given him 18 months previously. Treves found him a temporary bed. Touched by his plight, sympathetic members of the public donated funds. Joseph finally found sanctuary. Thanks to Treves, the Elephant Man became a celebrity among the upper classes. The Prince and Princess of Wales visited his apartment. I have a nice bright room made cheerful with flowers, books and pictures. I am very comfortable and I may say as happy as my condition will allow me to be. Treves organized secret holidays in the country for the young inmate. He delighted in Joseph's childlike fascination with the beauty of nature. From this day the transformation of Merrick commenced and he began to change little by little from a hunted thing into a man. As recently as the 1970s, a second possible answer to the riddle of the elephant man emerged, a condition called Proteus syndrome. Only a few people have ever been afflicted with this disease. Noah Southall is one of them. He's almost two years old, and he has Proteus symptoms. 
The impact on his body is devastating. The skin on one arm is erupting into a warty growth. Fleshy masses cover his chest. Inside, tumors are slowly crushing his organs. He was really sick. I mean, we spent lots and lots of time in hospital um, last year, mostly respiratory problems, because um, the tumors were just like taking over his whole, a lot of his lung capacity and pressing on his heart and all that sort of thing. Yeah, it's funny to see some of the doctors, um, a lot of them when we're going back to visit the hospital in Sydney, they um, didn't expect to see him again. He just does different things that he probably shouldn't be doing or they didn't expect him to do. So yeah, and that helps a lot. It gives us a little bit more encouragement that he will make it a little bit longer than what they think. Noah's condition is caused by a mutated gene. The gene is called P10, and many Proteus patients seem to have the faulty version. Could this mutation have caused the elephant man's terrible deformities? The link between the P10 gene and Proteus was discovered at Ohio State University by Professor Karis Eng. The P10 gene is a gene which is called a tumor suppressor gene. And a tumor suppressor gene can be thought of as the brakes of a car. And for a car or a cell to work well, it needs two brakes. And that means that a cell will grow, it will divide, and when the two brakes work, it knows when to stop dividing, it knows when to die off in a programmed cell death manner. But when those brakes are missing, the cells can grow out of control. At first, the results are not always obvious. These people are usually quite normal at birth, and then one side of the body grows larger, there are lumps and bumps. When we looked at a series of nine of such patients, um, which is a huge series because this is a rare condition, we found P10 alterations in these people. Only a few people are affected by Proteus syndrome, but its effects are debilitating. It's the little things you appreciate more too, just spending time with your kids and with Noah it is hard to get out and about but the times we do get out and about with him and Victoria are special times and although it's hard <coughs> to do it and there's a lot of preparation involved we still like to do it and it's the special times that, that help it. But he's a special little boy. Watch out. <laughs> Noah's parents will do whatever they can to help him. As his disease progresses, he'll be cared for by a loving family and doctors who understand his condition. Joseph Merrick had none of these things. As well as NF1, could he have had Proteus syndrome? Here we see the bones of the right leg, the bowed right tibia, working our way up to the enlarged right femur. The right hand is also bigger than its left counterpart. Going up to the pelvis, the right side of the pelvis is relatively normal compared to the left. Here we see the curvature of the spine and the breastbone curving in the opposite direction. And up to the skull, we can see that the bony outgrowths are mostly to the right side of the head, which supports Proteus syndrome. Patients with Proteus syndrome occasionally develop overgrowths at the sole of their foot, which we call moccasin foot. And this death cast of Joseph's right foot demonstrates this. Over here we have Joseph's death cast of his head and shoulders and as you can see most of the fleshy overgrowths are on the right side of his body. The riddle of the elephant man remains. Neurofibromatosis could cause some of Joseph's symptoms. Proteus syndrome could cause others and some could have been caused by either. So which solution is correct? To produce a definitive answer DNA experts will subject Joseph's remains to an intensive examination. Norwegian professor Erika Hegelberg will be the first to probe the hairs trapped in Joseph Merrick's death mask. Joseph's DNA may still survive inside. Over the years, thousands of people have handled the cast. 
she may recover multiple irrelevant samples of strangers' DNA. The other side of the coin is that we might not retrieve any DNA at all. Professor Hagelberg also wants to make the first ever attempt to extract DNA from Joseph's skull. If the hair doesn't pay off, the bone might. DNA may instead survive deep inside one of the huge bumps on Joseph's head. She's called in Dr. Thomas Hyam, another expert who knows the advantages of working with uncontaminated bone. I mean, it seems to me this, you know, he has got lots of quite thick bone, perhaps that might be the easiest place to go on, it's quite smooth. And, um. I like working on, on bone, because the bone is solid, and we can go for a little piece of bone that hasn't been exposed to the atmosphere, like the hair have. So I think, I'm quite optimistic that we should be able to get DNA out of a little piece of the skull. there's only a remote chance she'll be able to extract any DNA. If she does, it might not belong to Joseph. To establish whether it is his, she'll need to compare samples from Joseph's relatives alive today. Now first up this morning, we have a man with a mission. He's Peter Cousins from the Family History Association, and he thinks you may be... The local radio campaign to trace descendants of Joseph's mother's family has uncovered the oldest living member of the Potterton line. I heard it on the radio, uh, they were looking for descendants of George and Catherine Potterton. And I thought, that must be me, because my grandparents were named George and Catherine Potterton, and they came from Thermiston. Pat found she might have even more in common with Joseph Merrick than her genes. I first noticed my bump about 20 years ago. It was just a small bump, but it got bigger. And consequently, I have my hair over it now, see, that, that's it. But it was larger than that, actually. But it got, you know, it was growing and people started to say to me, what's that on your head? So I quickly had my hair like that so they wouldn't see it. It turned out to be an exostosis, a lump of bone, suspiciously like the bumps on Joseph's head. Could her bump be part of the elephant man's genetic legacy? Either way, Pat's DNA might help to unlock the mystery of his condition. A condition that could lie temporarily dormant in the family genes today. From Pat Thurmston, so we saw. He had to be related, but we didn't know. And it's only this, this, this uh, program that has proven the link. And now we've proven the link, I think we have a duty to see if there's anything from our genes that can help cure the disease for future generations. And to help do this, they will all give blood for DNA analysis. I do. Yeah. And did, did you? Did you? Except for one. Bill can't. He's having chemotherapy. Still, no one knows if his cancer is related to the riddle of the elephant man. On the 11th of April, 1890, Joseph's condition finally overwhelmed him. He was lying on his bed as if asleep, and had evidently died suddenly and without a struggle since not even the coverlet of the bed had been disturbed. He was only 27. It was a premature end for a dignified and sensitive human being. And there is no easy answer to the riddle of his condition. If Joseph had neurofibromatosis, why has there never been another case like his? The key to the riddle may hide in his DNA. 
There's DNA in every cell of our bodies. We pass copies onto our children and to our children's children. As the message travels through the generations, the copying errors slowly multiply. Did Joseph Merrick inherit a mutation from his parents that turned him into the Elephant Man? And was the fatal alteration passed on to anyone else in the Merrick or Potterton families? The pressure is on. The chance of Professor Hagelberg succeeding is slim. Against all odds, she pulls it off. For the first time ever, a scientist extracts DNA from the elephant man's remains. Now, other scientists on opposite sides of the world begin to write the final chapter of this medical detective story. They will search for the P10 gene, then look for mutations linked with Proteus syndrome. At the Collings Institute in Sydney, Australia, geneticist Dr. Debbie Marsh will carry out duplicate tests. The most exciting thing that we could expect to find would be a novel mutation in P10 that's never been reported before. I think it's a huge challenge to work with DNA that's 112 years old, so that's certainly going to be a challenge to people like me who are, you know, we work with fresh DNA all the time, but I think it's certainly achievable. Meanwhile, imaging specialists have recreated Joseph Merrick just as he appeared in 1890. It's a likeness of someone with neurofibromatosis or Proteus syndrome. Indeed, Joseph seems to have signs of both. It appears neither cause on its own can fully explain Joseph Merrick's condition. Could it be that he had both at the same time? It's possible that his features were so severe that he has indeed both NF1 and Proteus syndrome because NF1 is very common, so it's not out of the realm of possibility that he did have NF1 and coincidentally had Proteus syndrome, so truthfully and unrelated. We hate to give people two genetic syndromes but that cannot be ruled out. The scientists can't prove that Joseph did have Proteus syndrome. They have managed what was feared impossible, to extract and analyze the P10 gene from century-old bone and hair. It's the first time anyone has achieved this. Amazingly, the gene is completely normal. Even that doesn't absolutely rule out Proteus syndrome. P10 mutations are only accounting for a certain percentage of patients with Proteus syndrome. So we're not excluding the clinical diagnosis of Proteus. I think it's pretty amazing that we've been able to do this. I, I really do. A again, since the skeleton's been boiled and bleached and it is 112 years old, to get DNA that is good enough quality to sequence, I think is pretty amazing. It's cold comfort for Joseph's family. The tests confirm none of them has the corrupt version of the P10 gene. But Joseph's condition might be due to an as yet undiscovered mutation of a different gene. days like these, so I've tried to look after myself and lower my cholesterol. Flora Proactive dramatically lowers cholesterol. And clinical trials prove it. My cholesterol fell within weeks, and it's easier to control than these two. Proven to dramatically lower cholesterol. Flora Proactive. 
And now there's new Flora Pro Active with olive oil. Thomas Cook's biggest ever holiday sale is now on. There are thousands of holidays to hundreds of destinations. And you'll even get a free flight for every adult. The world on sale everywhere must go. I ho! 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 I don't suppose I'd be much good at that. <laughs> Use your head. Teach. Modern Arias. The stunning debut album from Tony Henry. It's out now. in two sizes. When you look in the mirror, you can instantly tell what's grey from what's great. There's a hair colour that can do the same, just for men. Just for men targets only your grey hair, replaces it with subtle tones like your own natural colour. Easier shampooing. In five minutes, you'll go from grey to great with Just for Men. By tonight, our participants will have had 63 hours of sleep deprivation. They face challenges, tasks, and mind-numbing chores. I don't know why you're being so horrible. Last night, Ellen was eliminated. I lack concentration and I just said I'll get it. So it's one down, nine to go for the £100,000 prize, shattered after Riddle of the Elephant Man. New tests confirm that none of the Elephant Man's living relatives have the genetic mutation related to Proteus syndrome. Worryingly, Joseph's condition may have been caused by an as yet undiscovered mutation. Does it still lurk in the Merrick and Potterton genes? Cancer specialist Professor Eng travels to London to answer the family's concerns. What are the implications then for the Selbys and Merricks of today, the Pottersons and Merricks of today. Let's pretend that Joseph indeed had a mutation in gene X that's yet to be found. Let's play the worst case scenario. Let's say that his mom gave it to him, her mom or dad gave it to her, which means that because everyone has two sets of genes, it's a 50-50 chance of getting gene X. This can be played along through all of the descendants, and I think by the time we come down to your generation, it could be 6%, 3%, or even less. Both of you do not seem to have the features of Protestant, not at all. They're in the clear. Joseph Merrick was truly one of a kind. After more than a century, the burden of fear finally lifts from the shoulders of his family. Bill Potterton never heard. He lost his battle with cancer. Others are still living in the shadow of the Elephant Man. I can deal with the pain. It's, it hurts, but I've been dealing with it all for a long time, so if I could just get around and walk and stuff, I, the pain wouldn't bother me. Don't let it get to me. No one suffering from NF1 or Proteus syndrome alone need fear ending up like the elephant man. The search goes on for a cure for these terrible diseases. <laughs> and Joseph's remains continue to contribute to the quest for a treatment. 
Could a modern surgical team do anything to help him? Using exposures far higher than any living patient ever receives, the team at the Royal London Hospital are producing the most detailed pictures ever taken of Joseph's skeleton. Yeah, um, on the facial bones here, um, if we, let's have a look at the scans yeah, yeah, here. Yeah. What we've done is we've Radiologist Otto Chan has created some remarkable images of the skull. And all I'm going to do is just show you uh, from the right side of the face. I'm just going to swivel this around a little bit so you can actually see. Um, this is now a front, relatively frontal view here. Um, and now if you look at the left side of the skull vault, you can see that it's relatively normal. At last, the doctors can see exactly where Joseph's normal bone ends and his deformities begin. For the first time, a modern surgeon, Ian Hutchison, can review Joseph Merrick's case. So in fact, most of the problems lie on the skull vault. Exactly. And, yeah. uh, and that, from a surgical point of view, is relatively low risk surgery. It's not as though we're going to involve the facial nerve, um, supplying the facial muscles. Um, so we're not going to run the risk of leaving him with a, a Bell's palsy, a, a weakness on that side of his face. I would have loved to... Uh, Set my hands on him surgically. I'm I think sure. I could have achieved quite a dramatic transformation. The Merricks and Pottertons have agreed to take part in another transformation. Imaging specialists will use facial templates from both sides of the family to reveal for the first time the true face of the Elephant Man. Joseph Merrick looked like, the normal young man trapped beneath that mass of flesh and bone. Tis true my form is something odd, but blaming me is blaming God. Could I create myself anew, I would not fail in pleasing you. If I could reach from pole to pole